Okay, I'd like to welcome you to today's um, session where we're going to talk about the Work, Family, and Health Network. Um, today we're going to have a number of speakers who will um, bring you up to where we are currently and give you some background of the study, um, starting with Roz King from NICHD, and then I will talk a little bit um, about the LEAF study in um, Boston and the Harvard site, and then Erin Kelly will talk about um, the work that Minnesota has done and particularly focus on some of the intervention work, and then we'll um, move on to Kelly Davis who will talk about activities that were going on that emanated from Penn State, particularly issues around our daily diary. So I will turn it over to Roz. Thank you, Lisa. I'm just going to give a quick overview of really the, very generally the history and conceptualization of the network. Um, so what is the Work, Family, and Health Network? It has been uh, it developed into six teams of investigators who implemented and evaluated um, a work family intervention in a distinct set of workplaces and examined the outcomes. It's interdisciplinary across social, behavioral, and health sciences. It's been funded by a coalition of um, institutes of the, and offices of the NIH, including the NICHD, the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, the National Institute on Aging, as well as other agencies and parts of the government, um, NIOSH of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Administration of Children and Families of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and outside funders as well, such as the William T. Grant Foundation. Phase one of the network ran from 2005 to 2008, and phase two ran from 2008 to 2014. Um, but those years are really only the official years of the network. Um, the thinking behind the network actually started almost 15 years ago or so, um, when Lynn Casper, who is currently at the University of Southern California, but at the time was at NICHD, um, and her discussions with Dwayne Alexander, who at that time was the director of the NICHD, about um, the contextual issues of work and work and family and work family conflict, and how this was an arena that affected a broad range of outcomes of interest to the NICHD, particularly family processes, parenting and marital quality. Um, adolescents' risky behaviors, and then more medically oriented things such as well child care and other preventative health visits, and breastfeeding. Um, so when you want to have a big NIH project, the first thing you have to do after you've identified why your own institute should buy in is to try to get other institutes and offices to buy in. So um, Lynn and then I came and joined the project in 2002, and other NIH staff work to develop a list of cross-cutting NIH interests as well. Um, so topics such as worker health, obesity, cardiovascular outcomes, sleep, and substance use um, are also topics that this network looks at that are of interest to the NIH broadly. Uh, we also work to reach out beyond our own agency. Um, so in particular, workplace health Worker safety, work organization and process are topics that NIOSH, which is the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health at the CDC looks at. Um, and then we were very pleased when the Administration for Children and Families joined into this effort. Um, they have a particular interest in parental job continuity and job loss and how that impacts families more broadly. So we held a series of conferences to gather the science together, um, the basic science to underlie this effort. Um, our first conference was on workforce workplace mismatch, and Suzanne Bianchi of the University of Maryland was our scientific chair for this event. And we published a volume off of that that you, is available. It, um, it groups the science into as many of the broad disciplinary areas that we could think of. Um, that would be relevant to this. And you'll see this broad representation when I talk about the science represented in the network. Um, we held two follow-up meetings. Um, the next one was on strategies and interventions. This was a very practitioner-oriented conference. We had speakers um, from groups affiliated with groups like the Association for Work-Life Professionals, um, people who run programs at the Department of Defense 
which, as you may imagine, has some massive work family issues when people deploy. Um, and then we had a methodological issues conference as well, because you know, for, in the medical field, the gold standard is the randomized control trial. And obviously, when you're talking about people's re real lives, we can't randomize people to various forms of work-family conflict or work settings um, or most especially into their families. So um, we had a statistical and methodological conference to talk about alternative research designs and what was ne would be necessary to show causality in this framework. So first we launched phase one, which was the 2005 to 2008 period, to develop study designs. Um, and these were the three goals of the phase one, um, to identify potential interventions, to um, create the conceptual framework that would link modifiable practices to health outcomes, and develop common protocol elements as well. So the research design that was developed um, was really quasi-experimental, and I think Jeremy Bray of RTI is, um, had brought in the term randomized field experiment, and that's what we've been doing. Um, we have multiple reporters. We don't just hear from the one individual talking about how things are affecting people around them. We talk to employers, we talk to employees, we talk to the employee's spouses and the employee's children. And we also use multiple methods. So it, it is, you know, there, we do interview people and we get their self-reports, but we also have more objective measures as well, such as biomarker collections. And those were done both at work and at home, as you'll hear. So um, the network is a cooperative agreement, so this is not just a straight grant. Most of what the NIH funds are grants, where we give the money to the investigators to do what they need to do. Um, it's not a contract either, which is where we are extremely directive. A cooperative agreement's in the middle, and so we, we give the money, and the primary responsibility is on the investigator, but um, one person from the NIH gets to be involved as a scientist, and I've had that privilege to be the project scientist on this, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on this endeavor. So through the network, um, the idea is that you need some extra coordination to wrangle everybody together. So we did indeed develop our conceptual framework and tools, um, both to serve as a basis for the field and also to, to take specifically into phase two. So again, this group is interdisciplinary across the network, not necessarily within each research team. Um, it's important because people are gonna work across their teams, so we didn't need a full range of interdisciplinarity within each one. Um, and the network members work together. We were very specific about, in, in the pilot phase, people did a lot of individual projects, but the work for phase two has specifically been collaborative. So there are six sites, um, and some sites did have a different PI between phase one and phase two, so I tried to indicate that, and I tried to keep on here. Some people were more involved in phase one, and some people more involved in phase two. But um, from the Penn State team, you know, Nan Crowder was our, the original PI, and then Dave Almeida and Susan McHale really ran phase two. Um, the Minnesota team switched from Phyllis Moan in phase one to Aaron Kelly's leadership in phase two. Um, and Lisa Berkman has been the stalwart of the Harvard team with uh, a lot of input from Gloria Sorensen and Roz Barnett in phase one and Orfeo Buxton in phase two. Um, fa um, Leslie Hammer and Ellen Kosick have been working together the entire time and we've had some changes in Kaiser um, and then RTI. Um, I'll speak more in a few minutes about the specific purpose of each site. So, um, for example, what are the disciplines that each of these sites have? Um, Harvard has really been our lead in social epidemiology, worker health, and sleep medicine. Um, the PSU, MSU, and now Purdue team, occupational health psychology and organizational behavior. Penn State leads in developmental psychology and biobehavioral health. And Minnesota is the site for the sociology of work and organizations and the family. So for the pilots, they each had a different workplace setting and worker population um, that then, in some cases, carried over to phase two. So Harvard um, was really looking at diverse low-wage workers, um, PSU, MSU um, in grocery stores, Penn State focused on hotels, and Minnesota had the extremely happy circumstance of um, being, a, right as they had submitted their application, being approached by a large corporate headquarters about doing an evaluation of a, a project they're about to implement. 
So um, they were in a, in a white collar setting. Kaiser has been our translation and logistics team. They have made the trains run on time and everything actually happened when and where it was supposed to in terms of our meetings and coordinating. And RTI has been the statistical methodology and measurement lead, um, human subjects protections, and they have been handling the data collection, archiving, and release during the grant period. And we had a lot of institutional regional diversity, which has served us well in terms of familiarity with working conditions in different, and businesses in different parts of the country. So all the way from Portland, Oregon, around to the Midwest, and up and down the East Coast. Um, and we did have an employer advisory committee. That was another thing that our translational center at Kaiser did. So all of these corporations um, and you know, companies big and small and um, a public um, government as well had input into the design and the work that we did. So thank you very much. Thank you.